Welcome to IT Pro TV. I'm your host, Don Vector, coming at you live from San Francisco, California. You're watching IT Pro TV. Welcome to another great show right here on IT Pro TV. You're watching the CompTIA IT Fundamental Show. I'm your host, Ronnie Wong, and today we're diving into a part two on basic security principles. Now, if you watched the part one, you know that Don left us with a cliffhanger. So back with us again to help deliver through and help us to see the idea here of what well, more confidentiality is going to be Mr. Don Bazan himself. Don, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks for having me back, Ronnie. And, you know, in part one, I introduced the concept of the CIA triad, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the three kind of facets of any IT security program. And we were talking about confidentiality. So we were setting the stage about how we should be able to reasonably expect our data to be private and that we control who has access to it. That's what confidentiality is all about. Well, one of the things that I wanted to touch on and ran out of time on was the expectation of privacy. Like, is that a realistic expectation and what does it actually look like? So we're going to talk about that in this episode and then we're going to move on to the other two elements that we didn't get to. We didn't talk about integrity or availability. So we'll get a chance to see all those right here in this episode. All right, so Don, here it is. You talked about the idea at the end of episode, uh, the, the first episode, I'm about to say episode one. At the end of the first episode here, we said we have to temper our expectations of this. So what do you mean by that? All right, so the internet, uh, shockingly, is not yours. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't belong to your company. It doesn't belong to your country. Uh, the internet is actually a network made up of numerous entities. They're called autonomous systems that are all kind of glued together and creating this friendly uh, almost communistic type network. Well, the thing about that is, as you browse the internet, as you use these services, there are many people involved in helping you get to that service. And most of the time, you don't even know who they are. They're companies that you're not even aware of or you've never heard of their names. And you're reaching out and using services provided by companies that you have heard of, but that you don't know employees of, that you have to have this like implied trust. Take Facebook, for example right? Many, many people use Facebook and many people put their personal information in there, the information about their family, their birth date, their pets, photos, when they're, when they're on vacation, so when their home is empty. It's all posted right there on Facebook. Really, really personal data, all right? Well, I know for me this is true. I'll bet for most of you out there it's probably true. I can only name one employee at Facebook, right? And that's Mark Zuckerberg because right. he's always in the news. <laughs> I can't name a single employee that actually works in a Facebook server room. All right? I, I, I don't know any. So if I start putting all of my personal information in there, which for the record, I don't, uh, <laughs> but, but if I did, right, I would be trusting all of those data center employees to handle my data securely and properly and not to be poking through it in the middle of the night or leaking it out on the internet or, or not properly securing it so that attackers could get at it. I would be putting my trust in those people. If you use Gmail for your email service or Yahoo Mail or any web-based mail, you're putting your trust in that company to protect your data and your interests. Well, in the case of Gmail, and I, I do use Gmail, I do put a ton of information in there. Google has a ton of information on me. <laughs> well, I'm trusting that they keep my data protected, but at the same time, I know they're using my data to be able to show me advertisements. So it's not like they're not looking at it. They are actually looking at that data. It might not be a person, it might be an algorithm, but it is happening, right? And that all happens in the background. Like if we take a look at my computer, uh, let me jump over to my actual machine here. So this, this is my, my actual laptop. And when I go out and I browse to a website, let's say that I go to CNN.com. I'm gonna browse to CNN and I get their webpage. Now, I know that I went to CNN because I typed it. And CNN knows I went there because I asked them, I said, hey, can you give me a copy of your webpage? So now somebody at CNN somewhere knows that I looked at their webpage. All right, well, honestly, that was, that was what I expected. This is like a conversation. If I talk to Ronnie, I expect him to know we're having a conversation, right? That, that's a normal expectation. But what about other parties? Do I want other people to know that I went to CNN? Well, do CNN, it's just a website, right? But I mean, there's, there's websites, maybe, maybe there's personal information, medical information, I don't want other people to know about, right? But the reality is, other people did know. At the network level, absolutely. In order for me to get to the CNN webpage, let me, let me fire up um, a little utility called Traceroute. Traceroute's a utility that shows me 
how, how many routers I had to pass through on my way to a website. So if I went to www.cnn.com and I trace it, it's gonna map that out. And I had to pass through four routers to get there. It's actually pretty short. The further away a server is, the more uh, routers you have to pass through. This first router, I trust it because I own it. It's in our server room back over there. That's our router, so I'm, I'm okay with that. The next one, GRU, that is our internet service provider. We get service through the Gainesville Regional Utilities, and so there's our ISP. So I, I trust them, if only uh, because we pay them a check. But I actually <laughs> I actually do know every single employee in their data center. So, so I have a good degree of trust there uh, with GRU. After that, though, who is this? 198.32.132.216. That's a name that's not familiar to me, mostly because it's just a number. But I don't know who that is. And then this last number here, that's going to be CNN. The, you know, the end of the journey is CNN, so I see it. But here's this one entry point in the middle that I don't know. I don't, I don't know what company that is. I, I don't know who works there. I don't even know what city that's in. But my connection passed through there. That's a risk. Right? Now, usually these are trustworthy networks, usually, but I don't know that network. The further away we get, right, in another episode, we had done a, a server in Russia. So I did Pravda to RU. Um, and I'm, I'm not singling out Russia. It's just the kind of on the opposite side of the globe. So I know that when I reach out to them, I've got to cross the Atlantic Ocean. I've either got to hit a satellite or a transatlantic cable, maybe a Pacific cable, probably transatlantic for us. Uh, and I can see it's eight hops away. And you'll see, you know, our router, our ISP's router, and then a number of systems that I have no idea who they are, right? That's trust. When I send my data across the network, how can I expect it to be confidential? Well, if we have things like HTTPS, right, secure web pages, which actually CNN, if I look at CNN's web page, it's secure. It's using HTTPS. It's encrypting my data so that when it passes across those ISPs, when those routers see it, it's encrypted. So they know I went to CNN, but they don't know what data I sent. They don't know what articles I read. They just see this, this encrypted connection. Hey, that's, that's confidential. It's perfect, right? Sort of. Here's where the expectation starts to break down. My data is encrypted from my laptop all the way to CNN. I know that because I see the little secure note right there in my browser, so I know I'm protected. But look at the rest of this web page. This web page is made up of elements, not just from CNN, but from a number of other servers. In the early days of the internet, when you browse to a web page, the web page was served from one server, and that was it. Nowadays, web pages can be served from many servers. And this one web page that I'm looking at right now contains elements from, let's see, 56 different <laughs> servers, which is ridiculous. Like CNN is the worst of, well, Fox News is pretty bad about it too. But if CNN is really, really bad about it. 56 different servers. Now I know CNN, all right, there's one. <laughs> what are the other 55? Well, I run a little utility called Ghostery. If you're ever bored and you want to try it, Ghostery, it's free. Um, it's a plug-in for your browser. And what it does is it lets you see all these connections. That's how I knew there were 56 connections. All right, how did I know? Here it is, 56. And if I go into my detailed view, I can start to see what those are. 39 of them are advertising trackers. What's a tracker? It's remembering what I did. It's saying, <laughs> Don went to CNN and clicked on this article, so now I'm going to sell him brown shoes. <laughs> and you know, you clicked on this other article, so it's time to buy tofu, right? That, that's what they do. They know what you read. I don't have an expectation of privacy when I go to CNN because they're sharing my data just by going there with all of these other sites, right? And there's a lot that are in here. There's 39 trackers, and we get past that. Uh, we get some kind of comment system for their chat, I guess, uh, comments, because new site comments are always you know, useful. Uh, <laughs> you got some more trackers down here for customer interaction, site analytics. Analytics are effectively trackers. They don't really care uh, where I'm going. It's more of like where I came from so they can generate more leads. Uh, and then social media down here, Facebook beacons and Gigya counters. I've never heard of Gigya before this very moment, uh, but here I am. They, they now know that I went to CNN today. So that should hopefully illustrate for you kind of what that expectation of privacy is. When you work with Facebook, when you work with websites like these, there, there is no real privacy with that data. So when it comes to something that's truly important, in the last episode I mentioned like the, the secret formula for Coca-Cola. 
you don't put that in your Gmail. You don't go to CNN's website and search for the one. You don't, you don't do that because you can't expect that data to be safe and protected. So that's a, that's a challenge that a lot of people have and uh, really starts to create one of the bigger weaknesses that we have and is why when we talk about that CIA triad, confidentiality is something we have to actively pursue to protect our, our systems and our information. Now, Don, speaking of that, what about something else, not the idea of just a website? But everybody just uses instant messaging today as part of this. Uh, is that something that we also have to worry about in confidentiality? Oh, absolutely. Um, email, instant messaging, text messages, uh, browsing web, any kind of web-based application, even regular applications, most of them, phone home in one form or another these days, all of those are different ways that we might be leaking information out. All right. Now, let's stick a little spin on this, though. What if not only could they intercept the information, but they could modify it? They could change the information. That could be really bad, right? Confidentiality is about keeping my data safe. Integrity is about making sure that data doesn't get manipulated. When I showed going out to CNN, I passed through four different systems. My router is one, I trust that. GRU is another, I trust them. Then there was that random element, and then there was CNN. I trust CNN to give me CNN's page because that's in their best interest, right? But that third element, I don't know who they are. When I went to Pravda, not, again, not singling out Russia, but I had to pass through a lot of routers to get all the way to the other side of the globe. Anybody along the way could, in theory, intercept my traffic. And when there's an intercept, there's a potential for what's called a man-in-the-middle attack, all right? Normally, when you talk to a system, you send data to that system, and you get a response back. When I talk to CNN, I expect CNN to give me data back, right? That's the normal expectation. But the more things you put in between you and a destination, the more likely it is that somebody could be in the middle, right? An attacker could pretend to be CNN. And I think I'm talking to CNN, but I'm talking to them. And they send me back a page that might even look like CNN, but isn't, right? They're now taking over and hijacking that, that session or providing that false website. And they can use that to do things like say, oh, hey, your password's expired, you need to reset it. Your password hasn't actually expired, but they give you a form where you type in your old password and your new password. Well, guess what? They've now got your old password. And if you had a new one, they've got your new one. So they can then take that and they can use that to access your resources. This is very common with Facebook and Amazon. There are a ton of web pages that masquerade as Facebook or masquerade as Amazon because they want access to your account. They want to be able to steal those credentials and that data. That is a real challenge. And so when we browse to sites like CNN, how do we know we actually have the real website? How do I know that the data is not being changed in transit? Well, this goes hand in hand with confidentiality. When I browse to a website and it tells me the website is secure, we've got this little SSL certificate up here that's giving us an encryption key that's encrypting data. Well, if somebody modifies that data, it breaks the encryption and it won't work. We won't trust that site anymore. If we go and it's not the right certificate, the certificate doesn't match the name of the site, then it breaks. So if somebody is masquerading as CNN, they would have to steal that certificate as well to do it. And if they didn't have that certificate, then we would know our web browser would warn us. Now, that's a web browser. There's other protocols like email that are way more trusting. Spoofed email is trivial. It is easy that I could write an email and say it was from Barack Obama and send it along. And when email was developed back in the 1970s and 80s, it was very trustworthy. And today, here we are 40 years later, email is still just as trustworthy as it used to be. So it won't even bat an eye at the fact that I'm saying I'm uh, bobama at whitehouse.gov, right? It's just, okay, fine, send it along, right? It's up to the mail servers now to step in and say, all right, did this actually come from the White House? And, and if they don't do that verification, the email just goes right through. That becomes really, really challenging. And that's why integrity is becoming a bigger challenge, a harder thing for us to maintain and, and, and make sure that we're protected. Uh, attackers can intercept your communications, manipulate them and send them along. They can intercept your communications and replay them later. So maybe I capture Ronnie logging into Facebook. I record that traffic. And then later I go to Facebook and I replay his traffic to log in. 
Well, a lot of systems will have techniques like timeouts. Maybe you've seen that. You know, you go to Amazon and, uh, whoops, Amazon.com, uh, and you go to log in to access your account. So I want to go to sign in. And then I get distracted and I walk away from my computer for a while. And then I come back and I try and log in. And what do I get? I get a timeout form that says, no, nope, you got to refresh your screen, refresh your browser, and then you can log in. Well, they're timing it out because if somebody recorded my login traffic, we don't want them to be able to replay it later on. So it's only good for a certain period of time. In fact, most systems use what are called OTPs or one-time passwords, but the password only works one time. So if somebody tries to replay it, it doesn't work again. SSL does that automatically in your browser. If we had to do that ourselves, imagine having to come up with a different password every time you <laughs> used your password. It'd be a nightmare. But computers do it no problem, right? They maintain that level of integrity. It's an important aspect of ensuring security uh, and making sure that we can trust the data that we're getting. Uh, there's a few other tools that are kind of in the, the toolbox on, uh, on this stuff. Uh, for example, um, well, the biggest one that comes to mind is not a single tool, but actually a class of tools. Do I have? Yeah. Three things. Uh, in the security world, they normally call this AAA, right? Authentication, authorization, and accounting, right? Authentication. That says that whenever we access a resource, it needs to verify that we are who we say we are. When I went to CNN's webpage, or if I go to Pravda's webpage, or if I go to anybody's webpage, it, they're going to have an SSL certificate these days. And that certificate is based off of a private key that only that site would know. And so when I see the, the public key that's generated from it, I can use that to verify and say, yeah, this is actually CNN. Or nope, this is somebody impersonating CNN. Right? If you want to see that, like what it's like when somebody's impersonating, there's a cool website called badssl.com. Badssl.com. And you can go to that website, and they've got examples here of what it would look like if for example, the host name didn't match, or if it was a fake certificate or a certificate issued by a non-trusted root. An attacker would be a non-trusted root. So if they've issued a fake certificate for CNN and you were to browse to it, this is what Google Chrome would do. It would come in and it would display this message. Warning, your connection is not private. It's using SSL, right? See how it's got the HTTPS with a slash through it? It's using SSL but it's not a trustworthy certificate, so we can't trust the data that's being sent across. This is the error that we get, right? Uh, and, and there's a number of different scenarios that break that down, like wrong host name, and you get a similar error. Uh, each error is just a little bit different versus when you go to a valid site and you see the nice little green box up there, everything's happy, it's working the way that it's supposed to. Uh, you know, when you have a proper key exchange or whatever, oops, not that one. Uh, that you'll see a healthy page that comes up, uh, like here. This is a healthy page, comes up, we get the green instead of the red warnings, uh, so I know that it's working properly, and our data is safe. So that, that's kind of one way of doing authentication. I'm, I'm, I'm verifying that site is who they say they are. For users, authentication normally takes the form of username and a password. I type in a password, and the system says, oh, yeah, you're done, you know the password. Obviously, no one else would know the password. That would be crazy. <laughs> that's not always true. So authentication might need to be extended. You might need to have dual factor or multi-factor authentication, which I talked about in the last episode. I might have to have a password and a little key that I plug in, or a password and my fingerprint, or a password and a retinal scan, or a retinal scan and a PIN number, or, you know, do two things, um, a text message with a code to be able to get in and log in. Those are all different ways that we can authenticate a user. Once they're authenticated, we need to authorize them. What are they authorized to do? What are they allowed to do? I can log into Amazon and I can buy stuff. I'm authorized to buy stuff. Can I delete items? Can I change their price? No. Now, at Amazon headquarters, there's an employee there who can delete items. There's an employee there who can change prices, right? They're authorized to do it. I'm just a customer. I'm not authorized to do that. On my own computer, I'm authorized to do all sorts of stuff. And, and you can see that pretty easy, too. Uh, if you're on Windows or Mac or whatever, uh, usually you can just browse into your file system and take a look at any file. In Windows, you would right click and choose properties. On a Mac, you can double uh, uh, two finger click and choose get info. And what you'll see in there are sharing and permissions. I'm deep as that. I have read and write access to this folder. So once it authenticates me and knows that I am deep as that, I'm then authorized to read and write on this folder. 
But if I was somebody else, I would only be authorized to read, not write. That's authorization. This normally takes the form of permissions. Uh, there can be other things like access control lists that can kind of contribute to this and, and other technologies like that. Um, a lot of times they're not based off of a username like I'm doing here. That's kind of cheating. What you normally do is what's called role-based access control where you're granted access based on your role in the company. So I might have a, if I work at a university, I might have a staff, professors, students, right? These roles. And as a student, I can access certain areas. As a professor, I can access even more. And as a staff, I can access everything, right? So you kind of delineate that based on the role they serve within the organization. That's another way to maintain integrity because only people who, who need permissions will have them. And it prevents unauthorized people from writing to data, changing data, and, and manipulating it. And then the, the last piece of this is accounting. And that's keeping a record of what happened. Logs, right? Most systems maintain a log or a record. Or they send out alerts, an email. Hey, warning, your password has been reset. You've probably received those. If I change my password with Google, they immediately send me an email saying, hey, your password was changed. Are, are you aware of that? Was it you? Right? That's a form of accounting, keeping a record of what occurred. And that way, if something bad does happen, we can figure out exactly what it was and, and where it came from. We can try and figure out what that cause was and fix it so it doesn't happen again. These three things, authentication, authorization, and accounting, make up a big part of maintaining the integrity of our data. All right, Don, that actually helps us to understand a bit more about the idea of integrity as well as confidentiality. And that does bring us to our final area of availability. Now, Don, when I first started learning about this, it didn't really seem to make sense to me that I wanted to secure something, but make it more available or make it available. So, Don, help us out with this concept. You know, I took a security course years ago, and, uh, and I, I had looked at the agenda ahead of time, and I saw this bit on air conditioning. I'm like, air conditioning? <laughs> I'm, I'm, looking, I'm trying to learn about IT security. What's that got to do with air conditioning? Well, when we talk about availability, that's making sure that systems are available when our users need them. If I have an email server, users should be able to expect to get their email and be able to log in and see it. There's a number of attacks that can make that not happen. If I take over someone's account, they can't get at their own email anymore. It's no longer available. Or maybe I'm just malicious and I want to take it offline. I could do a denial of service act. I could flood data at that email server. So much data that regular people can't get to it anymore. Right? That would reduce availability. Or maybe we go low tech and I go and buy a baseball bat at the local <laughs> uh, sports store and I walk up to the building and I find the air conditioning air handler outside. You know, they all have the, the big fans, the exhaust fans that are outside. And you take that bat or a crowbar or whatever, and you jam it down into the fan and you stop the blades from spinning. Okay, what's going to happen? What's going to happen is heat is going to build up inside of the building and not exit the building like it's supposed to. The, you know, the, the fans are supposed to take that heat out so the cool air can fill the building. Well, if the building starts getting hot, what happens to our servers? What happens to our computers? Eventually, they hit a temperature threshold and they go into what's called thermal shutdown. They power off because otherwise they're going to melt down. You don't want that. Well, if your servers power down, they're no longer available. So as an IT security person, we have to think of a lot of things beyond firewalls and antivirus. We have to think about things like physical locks on doors, fences around the building, generators in the event that we lose power, redundant air conditioning to be able to keep the temperature cool so our servers stay on. These are odd things that you don't necessarily think about in the IT security world, but they're absolutely under the realm of IT security, that we've got to keep these systems on and available. Many systems have stuff built into them to help provide this. So for example, I've got a picture here. This is an HP Procurve switch. Uh, it's actually the back side of the switch. On the front side, you see a bunch of ports with cables, not very exciting. Uh, but on the back side, what we're looking at here are four power supplies. This switch has four power supplies. Why? Well, if one fails, it still has three more. If two fails, hey, this one can actually run on two power supplies. It doesn't need all four. Um, I, I think this one can actually run on one power supply. Do you remember, Ronnie, on, the, on I, this program? I think it can. Yeah. Right. So, so this switch would be fine if, if even three of the power supplies failed. Well, two of the power supplies are run to one UPS, a battery backup. The other two are run to another UPS. So if a UPS fails, the other one is still there. A UPS is uninterruptible power supply. 
if we lose power to the building, these are big batteries that kick in and take over. Well, we don't need the batteries very long. We just need the batteries for a few minutes because if we lose power, generators can power up. And the generators can provide electricity. But in the, in the little window of time between power going out and generators restoring power, we need something to keep things going. And that's what the battery backups do. And that's part of IT security. We want to maintain availability even if we lose power, right? And that's a, that's a hard thing to plan for because we need power for pretty much everything in IT. Uh, but you, you plan for it with your critical systems. When companies plan for security, they do what's called a business impact analysis. And they say, if system A failed, how would that impact the business? If system B failed, system C failed. And by doing that, they identify which are the critical systems, which ones are really required to keep the company running. And then you take steps to ensure that those are always available, that they're properly cooled, that maintenance is performed on them, that, that you don't let those servers get 10 years old because they're going to be more likely to have hardware fail, that the critical ones need to be updated much more frequently, and that they have redundant hardware and other things available to ensure their, uh, uh, their availability. Now, this is just power supplies, right? Companies can have redundant buildings, entirely separate locations. Uh, in fact, one thing I like to do are, are backups, right? Backups where we store a copy of our data somewhere else. And that used to be hard. We used to uh, you know, have to like back up the tape and, and send it off with somebody. Now, there's all sorts of cloud services that are out there. Uh, for example, organizations like CrashPlan, where you can run a little client on your servers and it backs up all of your data to cloud storage. It's encrypted, it's secure. And now if your entire building was destroyed, well, that would really stink, right? But, <laughs> but at least your data would still be sitting out there and you could go and get it and retrieve it. Um, Microsoft, they have what's called Azure Site Recovery, where they can back up all of your servers, and if your facilities are destroyed, you can bring up virtual machines in the Azure cloud. You flip a switch, and all of a sudden, your systems are all back online up in the cloud uh, in, in, in just a, a matter of moments. Like That's amazing technology that provides you a level of redundancy that we didn't have in the past. In the past, if I wanted redundant buildings, that meant I had to buy two buildings. Well, buying one building is bad enough. <laughs> a second one, that's a ton of money. So only the largest enterprises were able to take advantage of that. In today's world, even home users can take advantage of this stuff. Services like Cra CrashPlan, <clears throat> I don't want to sound like an advertisement. Uh, I actually don't know how much they cost. I think it's like less than $50 a year. So nice. really, really small versus if you had to buy hard drives and set up a network and so on. So this world is constantly changing. There's new technologies that are coming out. But it all ties back to confidentiality, availability, and integrity. Those guys right there, that is the key tenant of IT security. All the different things I talk about, redundant power supplies, door locks, biometrics like fingerprint scanners, uh, the little key for authentication, um, SSL, all of those are contributing to these three areas, confidentiality, availability, and integrity. So, if you choose to move on to become an IT security professional, these are three words you're going to hear a lot. And everything you do should be improving at least one of these in some way. All right, Don. Well, thank you for helping us to understand the basic security principles here of confidentiality, integrity, as well as availability. These are those security principles that will follow you throughout your entire IT security career. And, well, it's actually a great thing to have the fundamentals down because it keeps you in it keeps in mind, right? The very fact that all that you do, regardless of what type of technique that you use, that it has to help us to secure and to make these things better. All right, Don, any other final uh, words of wisdom for somebody that says, hey, I think this is a great area? Sure. Uh, you know, if you if you watched Mr. Robot and then you thought, <laughs> man, these episodes on IT TV stink. They didn't do any <laughs> hacking, right? Well, that's uh, certainly true. We're focused more on the, the level of security. If you want to get into IT security and doing things like penetration testing is, is more interesting to you, those are in the more advanced certification courses. Uh, obviously, with, with CompTIA, IT Fundamentals is that starting point, right? Uh, security Plus, it covers all of the security concepts from a, a much more uh, uh, in-depth standpoint, a lot of the things that we talked about in these last two episodes. Uh, but then you get into things like Cybersecurity Analyst Plus and Pentest Plus, where you actually learn the, the activities that you go through to to see if you can break into a system or see if you can defend a system. And that's usually what people want to jump in and learn. But I just want to caution you right now, if you try and jump into those advanced courses without learning the fundamentals first, it's really, really hard. And so you'll, you'll struggle. 
learn the foundations, and then jump into the cool stuff that's on TV. It's just you know, you, it, just like anything, you gotta you gotta walk before you can run. That's kind of the the process you want to take with security. All right, so you heard it right here, and that means this is a great place for us to sign off for IT Pro TV. I'm your host Ronnie Wong, and I'm Don Pizet. Stay tuned right here for more of your CompTIA IT Fundamental Show. Thank you for watching IT Pro TV.